Thanks very much, Jaime, and uh, I too would like to pay my respects to the original um, inhabitants of this nation, particularly the Gadigal people of the Aura, a nation on which we uh, are working uh, this morning. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going I'm to build um, on what Gabrielle's been talking about, particularly in relation to the context of the graduate qualities, which most of you, are, I think, are probably aware of. I know some of you have attended some of the workshops that I've run over the last uh, few months or so. So uh, essentially, what the graduate qualities are trying to do is to um, deliver graduates with qualities that support first, second and third careers, because as we know, they're moving around much more frequently and rapidly than uh, we might ever have done. Uh, and in a, that context, we want to provide flexible, personalised and collaborative learning and assessment. And we want to value authentic learning through the assessments which we create, because um, if we think about what Gabrielle was just talking about, we, we want to make sure we can, in fact, embed uh, cultural competence into those assessments. So the graduate qualities are really, um, they're an underpinning of the curriculum that we're uh, teaching and that we're creating. And so they're, they're deep-seated qualities and they came about through discussions with employers. Uh, we went out to employers and we asked, what sort of uh, graduate do you want to see uh, at the end of the degrees that we offer here in the university? And they, they came back to us and said, well, actually, we, we don't just want, for example, an engineer who can build a bridge. We want an engineer who can build a bridge, but also who can explain what they're doing to lay people, who can write about what they're doing, who can communicate effectively, who can use digital literacies to do what they need to do, and so on and so forth, and who can influence others. Um, they pervade the entire curriculum, as I've indicated already. Um, they provide the basis on which the course content is supported. One of the important thing is, things, and that I think relates very much to cultural competence, is the promotion of interprofessional learning. We want to be able to work effectively across disciplines and in that context we need to be able to bring to bear the cultural competence uh, skills that we, that we gain through working through the uh, courses that uh, we offer. And Sydney graduates will be distinctive in the workforce because they will have been through this process. Um, we are unique in, in the sense that we are actually uh, going to determine the extent to which each and every student uh, in, uh, in the university at the undergraduate level uh, has actually assimilated the uh, concepts inherent in the graduate qualities, including cultural competence. And I'll get to that in a minute, but just very briefly, for those who are not familiar, these are the graduate qualities. So there's nine of them. These are the first, uh, uh, what is it, three, four, five. And these are the others. Uh, cultural competence is there. That's the definition. I'll call it a draft definition at this stage um, because the plan is that, that, that these definitions will be affirmed um, by the academic board at, the, at their last meeting on the 27th of November. So as you can see, cultural competence is the ability to engage ethically, ethically respectfully and successfully in intercultural settings. Now this definition has come from looking at all of the things that Gabrielle has put up, um, as well as at lots of other things as well. Um, in the course of a number of different months. So um, we'll see what that means in a moment. So the purpose then of the graduate quality here is to be able to um, work productively, collaboratively and openly in diverse groups and across cultural boundaries. This is the official purpose, if you like, of the university as a whole. And that sits nicely with what Gabrielle has just talked a little bit about. So in terms of the creation of the definition, um, we wanted to um, follow the guidelines set out for the creation of all of the definitions of the graduate qualities. We want them to be straightforward, scholarly, clear and concise. And we want them to be able to, un to be understood by uh, all undergraduate students. 
Uh, and we used, as I said, previous work done in committee and, and elsewhere and extrapolated that information to encompass all cultures. Initially, there was a, <coughs> there was a bit of a focus on indigenous cultures in Australia. Um, it was recognised that we needed to broaden that, to obviously to include indigenous cultures, but also to include other cultures, uh, including those, as Gabriella said, which we might take for granted uh, here at this university. We also uh, created a number of separate components of the definition. We thought, what, what is this definition actually composed of? What's inherent in it? And um, we'll look at those in a moment. Um, but all of this is to be reviewed in the light of the work that's being or has been undertaken and is still currently being undertaken on the creation of rubrics to enable us to actually work out um, the extent to which each individual student uh, has imbibed this particular graduate quality. And all of this to be approved by the Academic Board on the 27th of November. So these are the components uh, of the definition as such. Um, there are three. Um, we actually had two originally where the, the second and third ones here uh, were combined together. But um, these three now form the basis for the creation of the assessment rubric. So in terms of planning the curriculum, we're talking here about how do we um, actually embed these graduate qualities into the curriculum that we teach. In fact, um, most of this work has now been completed at the undergraduate level, or it should have been by now. I know it has been for science, um, where all of the graduate qualities are embedded in the uh, learning outcomes at the course level and uh, at the component level as well. And that's what I mean by an MLO there, that's a mid-level learning outcome because components are in fact the streams, programs and majors and minors that uh, comprise a degree. Um, so we're talking here about a developmental approach to, to embedding the graduate qualities which means that we're looking at not just seeing where a student is by the time they get to the end of their degree, we're looking at where they are when they come in, we're looking at uh, how they um, then are able to imbibe those qualities progressively as they work through their units of study, we're looking at where they are in the middle if you like and we're looking at where they are at the end and we're looking at being able to use that information to then um, I guess provide individual students with the sort of help that they need in order to get to a point um, which uh, they can feel comfortable with in terms of each of the graduate qualities. So we need to, th to ask the question about where the graduate qualities appear in the course or the component. Um, and that's a, that's a sort of a curriculum planning, curriculum mapping question for all of us really. Um, a lot of that work has now been completed for science, um, but there's more work to be done um, coming up uh, over the next few months in terms of development of um, <coughs> curriculum and assessment plans. And of course, side by side with all of this are the professional accreditation requirements, um, particularly in a range of areas in science. Not all um, areas have got professional accreditation requirements. Um, but where they are, where they exist, then there needs to be a um, coherence between the graduate qualities and those requirements. So those need to be expressed in the course learning outcomes and the mid-level learning outcomes. And we need to think about the teaching strategies that we need to employ to actually work through these concepts. And this is partly what we're here for today, to just think about some of those strategies some of the uh, strategies are ones that you've already employed, you will be employing, um, but others perhaps need to be modified to some extent as well. Um, the assessment plan, I referred to that a minute ago, and that needs to be um, obviously looked at very carefully because what we're looking at is the fact that um, not all graduate qualities 
need to be in every single unit of study. Um, and in fact, it would be inappropriate for that to be the case. So that those um, units of study where cultural competence is going to play an important role, we need to look carefully at how we teach the, those units, how we assess those units. And I'll look at a, a sample or a draft sample that has been prepared in science uh, in a minute. So that's essentially what I was just saying. But what we are doing is we're, we're going to be using um, something called the Sydney Curriculum System. Some of you are aware of it, um, which is a piece of software which will enable us to uh, actively map um, across and between um, courses and um, the mid-level components and also the units of study. And we're looking at a concept called derived mapping. Uh, some of you who have attended the workshops that I've run will be familiar with that. It's really saying that it's emphasising the fact that we're not looking at where the graduate qualities exist um, in the mapping process at the unit of study level. We're looking at where they exist at the course level and we're mapping down from the, the course level to the mid-level into the units of study. In a, in, a, in a derived fashion, shall we say. So that's the sort of um, fashion that I'm talking about here, where the graduate qualities define the Sydney graduate, the course learning outcomes define the degree, the mid-level learning outcomes define the uh, discipline and the unit learning outcomes define the unit itself. So we need to develop the qualities in students progressively, as I've indicated before, because we want to be able to help them to develop the, the qualities themselves as they progress through. And by working on curriculum planning and mapping, that really does help with this process of defining where it is that um, students will be uh, exposed to um, information, exposed to uh, if you like, uh, working through what these qualities mean for them and also um, embedding the assessment of those qualities into existing and new assessment <coughs> events. So we need to work out um, <clears throat> across the faculty which units are best suited to engaging with cultural competence. This may have already happened, I think, in the work that uh, Elise has been doing. Um, I haven't seen any of that, of course, at this stage. But let's look at something that's occurred in microbiology where we've got, um, and there's more information about the graduate qualities, of course, uh, on the intranet, and that's, that's a link to, to that. And um, I'll be providing this uh, PowerPoint presentation to Gabrielle and Jaime uh, so that you can, people can have access to that to later. is that we're not quite up to looking at the microbiology dimension yet. We have, you know, in our um, education committee, which I chair, uh, we, we still, we just got together all of our major learning outcomes. I just want to thank everyone in the room for the last minute ones that we did. We were at the board yesterday to be put into the agenda. We're going to show you those today. So the microbiology one, John, is uh, probably a bit of a surprise. Now, to give a context for the people in the room, um, microbiology, you might have heard Helen mention this in some of the committee meetings you've been in. Helen mentioned that microbiology was being used as an example of an assessment map. But I understand maps, and Mary, welcome back. <laughs> um, maps have also done this recently. I think I saw an example last Thursday. Thursday. So we're not really caught up to that microbiology assessment map, and I know Sorry. Peter McCallum is still working with microbiology and maps. Yeah, the only reason I wanted to show is just to show that you can actually map um, between units of study and the graduate qualities. That, that's all. It was only an example. Yeah, um, but no, I'm just letting everyone know this might be a surprise for everyone that, because they haven't seen it. You know, yeah. It really is a work in progress still. It's very much a work in progress. This is very much a draft. Um, 
giving you an indication of, as you can see, um, going through. End of June. That's a end of June. Mid year. Mid -year. Mm -hmm. We haven't started yet, everyone. We haven't started. We're just microbiology where they test us. Now, th this will work will only begin in earnest next year, so we might even well, start earlier. Well, I think if we begin in earnest next year, we'll be behind the eight ball, really. <laughs> anyway, um, that being said, then we have. Um, I just wanted to show you what the assessment rubrics might look like because we need to work with these as well. Now, I'm not sure whether people have been made aware of these or not, but uh, we are now pushing ahead with these to make sure that the graduate qualities can be assessed. So essentially what happened was that um, we wanted to try and find a common approach to the measurement of the graduate qualities. So we needed to do these four things initially and then uh, go to the process of measuring those, uh, that performance. So here is um, one um, draft rubric. This one is for cultural competence. As you can see, it's got the components down the left-hand side and then we're looking at creating, um, I guess, a language around student progression. In other words, a language around where we as teachers might find uh, a particular student to be. So we're going from a zero really, which is they don't display any cultural competence at all, up to a top level performance indicator there where, and it explains how that relates to each of the three components there. Well, yes, I Yeah, that is, that is correct. I mean, if somebody doesn't have any cultural competence at all, then that won't be indicated uh, on, um, you know, in the assessment that they, that they uh, do. So where did these come from um, and what is supposed to be happening in relation to these rubrics? The, the, what you've just seen is the, a draft of the um, common university or generic rubric for, graduate, for uh, cultural competence. And that will be then looked at by each faculty and, and um, discipline to see whether or not it needs to be contextualised in any way for that discipline. And then um, once that decision has been made, then we'll be looking at how do we then create assessment tasks to ensure that we can determine whether or not a student has actually uh, imbibe this particular quality in the extent to which uh, that has occurred. So we've got a range of next steps here and, and certainly Pauline has alluded to uh, some of those. Um, with the definitions of particularly of cultural competence that um, they will need to be uh, potentially contextualised depending on uh, what each faculty decides it wants to do. Um, because the important thing is that students need to understand how it relates to <coughs> what they're trying to achieve in doing the particular degree. Uh, we then need, we need to develop assessment plans, um, which is what Pauline has alluded to, uh, which explain how the graduate qualities um, can be assessed um, within a particular course and within that framework. And that, that's something that we're going to try and do by the middle of next year uh, across all undergraduate programs. Um, with the rubrics themselves, you also need to think about whether or not they need to be contextualised uh, to make them real and meaningful for uh, students in, like in physics and chemistry and in biology and so on uh, across the board. And then, of course, we need to um, provide um, ways to um, help teachers to embed the graduate qualities in their teaching. How do we um, find and devise um, activities, um, tasks and so on that can in fact show um, students what cultural competence for example is all about. 
Um, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later on uh, this morning. And we want to identify uh, and use some existing examples because there are existing examples around and about um, of learning activities. And we need to work out appropriate assessments to, to address those within each, um, within, within each unit of study that is relevant for a particular graduate quality. We then need to, uh, and this will be done through, throughout next year, validate the um, assessment rubrics themselves um, in order to make sure that at the end of the day what we're telling students is in fact valid. And we'll be assisting um, staff with professional development workshops in order to do that during the course of the rest of this year and also next year. So we've had a number of uh, workshops already, some of you have been to those. So the next um, lot of workshops for course and component coordinators is about um, developing assessment plans. And then uh, we're continuing to run the unit of study workshops as well um, for uh, unit of study coordinators and we'll be running those on demand. So when we, um, when we get a call, if you like, from unit of study coordinators, then we can, we can run those workshops. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say, Jaime. Um, it's really just a, a, an overview of the, of the curriculum transformation landscape, I guess, and where, uh, what we're trying to do in relation to cultural competence fits, fits into that. We have time for a couple of questions. John, will, will attendees here be getting a copy of the draft rubric? Is that available for us to look at? Uh, yeah, yeah uh, for the cultural competence one, yes. It, well, it's on the PowerPoint slide, so. Great. So I think that will be really helpful when we come to embed all the embed curriculum. Uh, it's been going along, a, a lot has been going on in the background, and I think it's, mm -hmm. it will be good to actually be able to start applying it. I don't, I don't think we've actually got notice from the DBC in portfolio that we're those things have been finalised yet. Yeah, they haven't been finalised. So they haven't been finalised. So if you were to take that particular rubric, um, you'd need to treat it as an example. Yeah, because we did receive some that went through committees that were saying they had no, they had no ability in the area mm. whatsoever. The feedback, the feedback was that we probably didn't want to be saying to students they had no ability to use whatsoever to influence anyone. Uh, the intent is to the, the intention is to give students something that they can go to their employers or prospective employers with, which means that it, it's likely to be um, a statement uh, in relation to each of the graduate qualities, which is an addendum um, to their transcript. That's the current thinking. I can't say that that's what will happen because that's just the current thinking. So they might have a, say, the rubric, they might have a checklist of things in the statement saying that they're going to apply a modifier to such and such a thing. The language used would be taken very much from the rubrics. So in other words, if we found a student would fall into, say, category three for a particular uh, component of graduate quality, that language used in that particular cell there describing that person would be the basis of the language used on the, on the transcript. If I can just add to that as well, I'm only one of the working parties and it's very much up, it's very much in debate what will actually be on the student transcript. Uh, there's schools of thought that say they should only get the sort of high rankings listed and not the lower ones. Um, it's, it's very much... Yeah, these things are still in discussion. We have time for one question. Uh, so, I guess, sort of on that. since you were saying that science may word our um, rubrics differently or contextualise, right. yep. uh, would that flow up to this statement that goes as an amendment somewhere? Yes, indeed. So, if, if, for example, the faculty decides it wants to uh, use particular forms of words in, in the rubrics, then those forms of words will be the ones that will form the basis for uh, the statement that accompanies the transcript. Yeah.